It does make a difference. Uh, lovely to be with you. Um, uh, and uh, welcome back, or if you were here yesterday, or welcome. Um, just to um, add to John T's explanation, I'll, I'll use the PowerPoint to put lots of verses on the screen. Um, I'm sorry if I chose a too small font size, but I can't change it now. Um, uh, the, what is on the screen is identical to what is on the handout. So if you're happy just to look at the screen, just follow it on the screen. Um, but if you'd like the handout, as John D says, you go to the website, go to week one, go to the program, go to week one, go to seminars. Um, so you could open that up on your phone or something now, or if you'd l somebody who'd like to look at things later, it's all there for you. You don't need to um, scribble down everything on the screen as we go. Uh, begin with this verse, 2 Peter 3. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward. That passage in 2 Peter is about looking forward to the new creation, the home of righteousness. We'll come back to this verse later on. Uh, if you were here yesterday, we thought about how we look back to grace appearing in Jesus' coming, in his life, death, resurrection, ascension, and how we look forward to glory and we live between those two. And we thought yesterday about some of the sort of tensions that created in living in that in-between time. Today we're thinking primarily about looking forward. In keeping with his promise, we are looking forward. God has promised things to us. And if he's promised it, we want to be people who have that promise in mind, whose lives are shaped by that promise, in keeping with what he's promised, we are doing something. We are orientated towards that promise. That's the idea. How do we live life looking forward? Well, I'll tell you one way we could do it. Um, I had a look this morning at a website that you could go to called Rapture Ready. Um, if you don't know, uh, the rapture is a teaching that Jesus will return to uh, take all believers from the earth and take them back to heaven. But it's not, it's not his second coming. It's a precursor to that. I don't actually think scripture teaches that. Some people do. Uh, rapture ready definitely does, as the name would imply. And they look at events going on in the world, uh, wars, assassination attempts, what's happening in the Middle East, and so on. And they say they're not predicting when the end is. They say they have a rapture index. And they say the higher the index, it's, they say it's like a prophetic speedometer as to how fast we're hurtling towards the end, as it were. And they have a kind of rating thing as to whether it's sort of low or medium or high. And above a certain number isn't simply high. They just label it as fasten your seatbelts. Uh, and, and that is the rating at the moment. Now look, I, you know, it's very easy to smile, and I do think it is actually slightly funny. What is good about that website, and if I checked it regularly, what might it do? It might actually mean I look forward. I might think they're wrong in certain ways, but actually they are living with expectation. My problem, and probably many of our problems, is that while we might not get into speculation, we don't live with much expectation. Are we fulfilling this verse? In keeping with his promise, are we looking forward? So what I want to do, I want to get into some of the issues of uh, speculating and looking forward and so on, but also think about kind of how we wait so, let's just think about um, when Jesus is coming and some of the key verses that people often cite. Some verses would say we cannot know when Jesus is coming. Uh, we looked at this in, um, uh, with regard to the day of the Lord yesterday. Paul in 1 Thessalonians, now brothers and sisters, we do not write to you about date, times and dates. We don't need to write to you for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And of course that that um, idea of thief comes from the words of Jesus. We'll look at them in just a second. And the whole point of a thief is they don't tell you when they're coming. You know, they don't leave a note saying 2 p.m., you know, dining room window. Um, and they don't leave clues. 
the whole point is you're surprised. And you don't, so Paul says, I don't, I'm not going to write out times and dates because you know it'll be like a thief. You know we can't know. And that, of course, comes from Jesus. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Same point, Paul is working off the Lord Jesus' words there. You do not know. You cannot know. We're going to come back to the, some verses similar to that in a bit later on. But then there are some verses he will talk to, hang on, we can know. Matthew 16, Jesus says, you know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. And I put this verse up because a lot of people will use that phrase, signs of the times, and say, Jesus told us to read the signs of the times and so understand what was going on, etc. Now, as it happens, I don't think this verse um, means we read the signs of the times about when he will return, because when you read it in context, it is all about understanding who he is in his coming, in his first ministry, and the Pharisees not understanding who he is. And he says, you can't read the signs of the times. You, you don't understand what's going on. You don't see who I am. You don't realize the fulfillment I'm bringing. So yes, it's about reading the signs of time, but it's about Grace appearing, not about glory appearing. Okay, but what about this verse? Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near, right at the door. And this is in the context of Mark 13, which has the Son of Man coming on the clouds and so on. When you see these things happening, you know it's near. Now that's a much more serious verse to have to deal with as to whether we can predict and know when Jesus is coming and reading what is happening in our world. So for the first half of our time or more, we're going to have a look at Mark 13. Yesterday I did loads of verses. Today we're going to spend a fair bit of time in Mark 13. So could you open Mark 13 in some form in front of you, and we're going to walk through it. This verse comes from the end of the passage, and by the time we get there, I hope to show you how I would understand uh, that verse. So Mark 13 Uh, as Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to be fulfilled? So they're in the temple in Jerusalem. I uh, say, so isn't this an amazing building? Isn't it incredible? And it was an incredible building. It was a sort of centerpiece of uh, Jewish kind of life, religious life. I, there isn't really an equivalent um, in the UK. I mean, in, 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 in the US, maybe the Capitol building in Washington or the, the White House or something, something that stands for kind of your nation and the centre of your nation. And they say, isn't it amazing? And Jesus says, it's going to be destroyed. Not one stone on another. It's all going to be wiped out. And you think about, the, you think about saying that of something like the Capitol building in, in Washington or, 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 or Westminster or something, and you think, man, what a, what a cataclysmic event you're talking about. This, is, this would be like the destruction of our nation. And so they wait until they're up on the Mount of Olives. If you've been to Jerusalem, there's, this, there's a valley between Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives, the Kidron Valley. And if you're sitting on the Mount of Olives, you face over Temple Mount and you can see the temple. So they're sitting there, they look back and they say, well, tell us about it, Jesus. Notice the specific question, when will it happen? And what will be the sign? Verse 4. But this is all about the end of the temple 
They are not at this stage asking about the end of the world. That's the question. And Jesus then teaches them, first of all, I think, he gives them a variety of signs that are not about the end. So, verse 5, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumours of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. So, so notice here he's saying lots of stuff's going to happen. Stuff that could be kind of alarming. Wars, rumours of wars, uh, famines, earthquakes and so on. That's not it, he says. That, uh, you know, that, that's not the end. Beginning of birth pains. It's like the early, early kind of tweaks before labour really starts. Uh, you must be on your guard, verse 9. You'll be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues on account of me. You'll stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. So there's, there's, there's a job to do. The gospel's got to go out to the world here. Whenever you're arrested and brought to trial, don't worry about what to say beforehand. Say what, speak whatever's given to you at the time. It's not you speaking, it's the Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. This is a period of time where there are various world events happening, the preaching of the gospel happening, and persecution of Christians happening. But these, this is not the end. It's like this is just normal life. Oh, the disciples are going to have to be careful because they'll be put on trial. Um, there'll be persecution from family members. But this is simply what life will be like. And of course, as we read the book of Acts, we see much of this happening. And this sort of stuff has simply carried on throughout history. There have been false messiahs. There have been lots of wars. There have been many earthquakes and famines, uh, pandemics, lots of persecution of Christians. And the point is, we mustn't be thrown or alarmed by people saying that such events mean more than they do. Verse 5, watch out that no one deceives you. It might feel like the world is spiralling out of control sometimes, but this is ordinary life. So you stand firm, verse 13. <coughs> but then... There are signs of the end. Verse 14. And verse 14, it depends on your translation. I'm reading from the NIV, and it just says, when you see. It actually, really, you should have the word but in front of that. Because it's a contrast from what he's just said. Here's all the ordinary stuff, but when you see this, now this is different. So when you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down or enter the house, take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in winter because those will be days of distress, unequal from the beginning when God created the world until now and never to be equaled again. Um, Rather than ongoing events, verse 14 is a very specific sign that should initiate a specific action. When you see this, run. Run to the hills, basically. Um, don't pack a suitcase. You know, don't go back for your coat. Just get out of there because it will be awful. Uh, I, I believe, and 
it's not just me, it's very standard understanding, that Jesus is referring here to the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70, which was an appallingly horrific war. We have um, accounts from outside the Bible about how ugly and horrible it was. Um, and this was the time that the temple was destroyed, when, the st when it was dismantled and so on. Um, in a parallel passage in Luke's gospel, there's the, this, the, this account comes in Matthew, Mark and Luke. There might be some differences between them. I'll mention that in a minute. Um, but Luke specifically at this point says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, get out of there. And Jesus says, when you see this sign, whatever it is, we'll come back to that, don't run to Jerusalem as a place of safety, which would have been their instinct, go to the hills, because this is the time that Jerusalem is going to fall. So what's the sign? When you see the abomination that causes desolation. That is a quote from the book of Daniel. Uh, Daniel predicted in his prophecy some detestable event which resulted in the desolation of the temple, the defiling of the temple. And uh, the, the normal interpretation of that in Daniel is that it was fulfilled in the second century BC. Uh, a pagan ruler uh, called Antiochus Epiphanes desecrated the temple. Uh, he set up an altar to Zeus and sacrificed a pig on it in the, te in the Jewish temple. And if you know anything about Jewish religion, it's sort of like, <laughs> you know. And we don't know exactly what happened that Jesus is referring to, but some kind of parallel event. We do, the fact is, we can't pinpoint it. Uh, best guess is probably when the temple was turned into a garrison, there was fighting and murder committed in it. Uh, Although we can, can't pinpoint it with certainty, again, from outside sources tell us that Christians at a certain point fled Jerusalem prior to the siege because of Jesus' words. And this then, I think, is the specific answer to the disciples' question, what is the sign that this is about to be fulfilled, that the temple would be destroyed? But they would be wrong, I think, to identify that with the end of the world. So Jesus then goes on. Um, uh, verse 20 onwards, uh, so that goes, goes to the section before, you know, you haven't cut short those days, no one would survive. Don't be deceived, people pointing to messiahs and so on. And then he kind of sums up in verse 23, so be on your guard, I've told you everything in advance. Okay? I've told you what to watch out for, watch out for this, okay? Verse 24 again begins with a but. But in those days following that distress, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, and he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. So I think there's a break in the passage here. Be on your guard, I've told you everything. But in those days following, there'll be something else. Something f happening after the fall of Jerusalem. And verse 24, 25 is a, is a mix of Old Testament quotes or allusions, all of which referred in their Old Testament context to the day of the Lord that we looked at yesterday, the day God turns up. It's a day when, verse 26, everyone will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And this is an allusion to Daniel 7, you may know. Uh, Daniel 7 has a picture of the Ancient of Days, courtroom scene, and one like a Son of Man comes on the clouds. Daniel 7, I think, is often misinterpreted. It is, in the first instance, about the enthronement of the Son of Man. He's coming on the clouds, but he's coming on the clouds to God's throne room. 
He's not coming kind of from heaven to earth on the clouds in Daniel 7. So the, the, the direction of travel is opposite to how we sometimes think. He's coming on the clouds, he enters the presence of the Ancient of Days, and he is given all authority over every race. It's the enthronement, exaltation of this Son of Man who will then rule. And that means, and here's a little aside, I don't want to make it too complicated, that means some people actually interpret this passage and these verses here not as Jesus' return, but Jesus' exaltation. And they see that the fall of Jerusalem is almost like the, um, the final marker of God's judgment on apostate Israel and vindication of Jesus as his enthroned ruler. I, I don't think it quite works, but I understand the kind of the rationale. I think Jesus has moved on to a second issue. I move on to his return because his exaltation in Daniel 7, going on the clouds into the throne room and being given authority, means he will rule over every nation and at some point every knee will bow to him. So I think this is now the end of the world where Jesus gathers his elect from around the world. I think he moves from the, from the fall of Jerusalem, the end of the temple, to the end of the world because kind of the, 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 the two are separate events but are kind of linked. God's judgment falls and he rescues his people in the end of the temple. And it's almost like a little mini version of what will happen on a worldwide scale when Jesus returns. So what about signs and predictions? Come to verse 28. Um, the, the, the reason I'm pretty confident Jesus is talking about two separate events here, temple and end of the world, is because of what he goes on to say now. What he's dealt with so far is what will happen and the signs. Now he comes to the timing. So verse 28 is the word verse we looked at earlier. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs, twigs get tender and leaves come out, you know summer's near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near right at the door. I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away. My words will never pass away. So you can, you, you can see it coming. You can spot the signs. And it will happen in the lifetime of the people listening. Yeah? Is that a fair paraphrase? Verse 32 but about that day or hour, no one knows. Huh? I think the only way to understand that contrast is that he's talking about two events. You can know about this one, and in fact the term these things, these things happening, has occurred earlier in the passage about the, the, the fall of the temple. These things. When you see these things going on, you know it's coming, Watch out, you can see it. It'll happen soon in your lifetime. But about that day, nobody knows. This is the strongest argument, as I say, for talking about two separate events. We can, indeed, we should, or they should, have looked for and predicted one, the first, but we cannot predict the other but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, only the Father. Be on your guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. And we'll come to the rest of what he says there about waiting in just a moment. So he moves to how to, well, verses 35 to 37, he moves to the waiting for the end. And we'll, we, that's going to form our second half about how that, that, that then is how we're going to wait. That's the bit that kind of really applies to us today, and we'll come back to that. Um, let me just say, what we'll do, I'll say a few more things about some of the, um, the kind of the speculation 
stuff, and then we'll pause and have some questions, and then we're going to go on to think about, well, okay, okay, fair enough, Graham. So how do we live looking forward? Okay? So other stuff about predictions of signs and things. I think most of the things people talk about in this category are things that are characteristic of the whole age. Things like wars, rumours of wars, earthquakes, famines, and so on. Of course, there are moments when those are intensified in world history, but then they die away again, and then they come back again, and so on and so on, and that is just what happens. They are characteristic of this whole age. And they are usually not spectacular things, like miraculous things, but normal parts of life. Um, I mean, this is a slight aside, and um, I don't want to give away my political leanings, but I've in, I was intri in, intrigued by some of the coverage over Trump's attempted assassination, which, of course, is an appalling thing. A lot of people are talking about it as a miracle, and that God protected Trump. Well, I think God's active in the world today, I'd like people to comment on the person that was killed because somebody died and they didn't protect, God didn't protect him. Um, but if you kind of go, that's a miracle, that, that, that you, you end up in spectacular things. God's doing something special here type stuff rather than somebody missed, you know. And I think this is normal stuff, not spectacular stuff. And so what you do get is you get people making jumps from events like that or, you know, classically, um, the reformation of the nation of Israel was read as a spectacular event that must have been God working. And then some of the um, Arab-Israeli wars that there have been, particularly things like the Six-Day War, where Israel did indeed triumph in a kind of quite remarkable way, true, People read those as this is specifically God's hand on history achieving his purposes and therefore this event is really significant in timing. And all of that is usually part of a broader, what I've called a theological schema. Let me explain. Um, we have to work out how to kind of put the whole Bible together. You know, prophecy, you know, the nation of Israel. And somebody asked yesterday, I said we'd cover it today. Someone asked yesterday about the nation of Israel. Uh, God's plans and purposes in the Old Testament clearly focus on the nation of Israel. Abraham, his descendants, the nation of Israel, that's who he makes a covenant with. That's who he makes promises to. That's who the prophets speak to. We'll see this in Isaiah in the Bible readings. But Jesus clearly claims that he fulfills all of that. And he says all of the Old Testament points to him. Um, and, you know, the verse we saw yesterday that we look back to some of that. It's examples and stuff for us to learn from those who live in the culmination of all of this, the fulfillment of all of this. So one main way of reading the whole Bible is to say, yes, God used Israel, but Israel, as it were, all points forward into Jesus. And at the other side of Jesus, you then have the church. And the church, as it were, inherits all of that sort of Old Testament history. That's our history. There is another way of going where people say, well, God made promises to Israel, and those promises involve the land, um, and protection and return to the land and various other things. And then God sent Jesus, and that's to bring in the Gentiles. But as it were, we're now on a two-track system. The promises to Israel keep going. And now we have new things going on through Jesus for the Gentiles. And that's a bit crude, okay? There, there's, there are some quite complicated and sophisticated ways of putting this together, but I'm putting it just simply... Is it one track? Israel goes through Jesus into the church. Is it two track? And if you have a broader schema that says it's two track, you usually end up saying, so what's happening with Israel now? And prophecies in the Old Testament about return to the land, well, you think that's fulfilled back in the 1940s. And you see events happening in Israel now as, oh, well, m maybe that, 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 that nation is, is Gog or Magog and they're attacking God's people and so on. And this is where a lot of the speculation stuff comes from. 
And what I'd like to do with a lot of it is just to back right up and go, well, let's just talk about how the whole Bible works first, rather than arguing over what that prophecy in Ezekiel does or doesn't mean, because I think it doesn't apply to Israel today. And so I do not think these can be used to construct any kind of timetable of return. Um, it is interesting to ask of typ typical features of predicting the end. Because you, you know people have predicted the end of the world and just return many, many times through history. And it is quite salutary sometimes to look back. In the 17th century, it was rife. Um, amongst Bible-believing Christians, a lot, of, a lot of Puritans, wild about the end, absolutely wild. You know, you read some of the stuff, you know, we are living at the blowing of the sixth trumpet, and soon God will pour out the bowl of wrath, etc., etc. The reason? Because the 17th century was a moment of great turmoil and upheaval. They killed a king. It had never been done like that in Britain before. They had a commonwealth. They thought they were bringing in the golden age, and so on. So one thing that is characteristic of predictions is often some more momentous events within history, what I've referred to as sort of intensification of wars and rumors of wars and famines and so on. So there's a pandemic and suddenly people are going, it's all, it's all happening. That's one thing that's characteristic. Well, what else do you think is characteristic of predictions of the end? So, no, no, in, terms, in terms of what, 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 what is common amongst all the predictions in terms of how they work? Uh, potentially signs of spiritual decline, yes. I mean, so in, yeah, and, the, the, and in a similar vein, they would connect it with the return of Israel. Antichrist. The Antichrist coming, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm not asking a very good question. I can't think how to phrase it. But it's one of those guess what's in my pocket questions, isn't it? You kind of go. Um, um, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what I'm after. There's two, two other things. Right? Uh, first, they've all been wrong. Right? They've all been wrong. But secondly, interestingly, they've all been, bar one or two exceptions, they've all been relatively soon. Nobody tends to predict the return of Jesus in 200 years' time. It's always in the next. In other words, it ties in with a, well, it must be now. Why? Why must it, why? I just think that's quite salutary to realise. Okay, look, there is Mark 13. There is some stuff on predictions. We're going to move on to how we are to wait just for one moment with your neighbour, what are you taking away from that? What do you find helpful about that? And any questions you've got, we'll have a few minutes for questions and then we'll press on. So with your neighbour, you've just got a couple of minutes. Go for it. Go for it. Hello. Okay, yeah. I'm on. Um, thanks so much for this. I am intrigued as to, I don't know how much you'd know about this, but what a non-Western perspective would be on reading these passages about the end of the world. I'm intrigued as to whether there'd be like a, a distinction in the way that perhaps the church in the global south would read passages about kind of wars and rumors and wars and, and kind of global pandemics and things as, as to whether people would read and interpret those things in the kind of often way that we go cl climatically and say, oh gosh, it must be the end, whether it would be read differently. I'm just intrigued as to whether you, you yeah, know anything on that? That is, that is a very interesting question. I was writing um, a commentary uh, last year, and one of the things the editors of the commentary series wanted people to do was to engage with broader global perspectives. And I was reading commentaries written by people, say, in Southeast Asia and that sort of thing. Um, I haven't done that on this passage. Um, so I'm afraid I can't comment, but it's a very good, it's a very good question. Other thoughts, questions? Sorry, I was behind the collar. Oh, yes, you're hiding from me. <laughs> yeah. You could have just been a disembodied voice appearing, but. Thank you for that breaking, uh, you know, breaking up that passage from Mark. I, I found that really helpful. But in our, our church home group recently, we've been studying the book of Revelation. Mm. And as you're aware, there are there th three um, groups of signs. 
given by, by John of, of that, that revelation. Now, our interpretation of that is a lot of that, again, is symbolic. Mm. So, so as, as you've said, trying to tie it down to specific events, which some do, we, 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 we kept away from that. But, but what, what's interesting is that there's a lot of information there, isn't there, about what's going to happen in the future. And yeah. it's clearly there for a reason. Yeah, yeah. And I think the, the one big thing we took away from that is again this message about standing firm in the reality of the chaos and, and, and all that's going, the madness of the world. Yeah. But the point I just wanted to make, which you, I think is helpful for looking forward, is what we see is that things seem to be getting worse. And, and as you get nearer to what seems to be the end, the second coming of Christ, there will be a, a, an extreme period. So is it appropriate for you to perhaps comment? On yeah, that? yeah, I thank would, you. I would find that helpful. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, so look, we could do loads of stuff on Revelation at this stage. Um, I think we do have a slight misunderstanding of the book of Revelation, that we think it is all about uh, kind of predictions of the end. Now, and clearly, Revelation ends up with the new, with the new Jerusalem. You know, so it is about the end, I think, but I think the majority of the book of Revelation is actually about living for Christ now. It's very interesting to think, well, what, what should John's original readers have read beyond, say, chapter 3, after the letters to the churches? Is the rest of it just about some point in thousands of years' time, in which case they can go, well, that would be nice for them? Or does it mean anything for them? So, I mean, just one example in terms of how revelation works. Chapter 13, the beast out of the sea that persecutes God's people. Um, the way it's called, it's called apocalyptic language. It's, it uses, it's highly symbolic. That doesn't mean it doesn't represent real things. We don't kind of, you know, sim, symbolize it away. Oh, it doesn't really mean. No, but what it does do is it elevates it out of any one historical example. I think the beast out of the sea is representing particular political powers that persecuted God's people. And in the first instance, it was the Roman Empire. And then the number 666, I think, refers to Nero and things. I can explain why some other time. But the point about it being represented in this horrible beast that does things is that while that one embodiment of it might be Nero... There'll be other versions of beasts where Satan will use political powers to persecute God's people. And so people in, you know, Sudan or Pakistan or wherever could read that passage and go, yes, we're experiencing this. And so an awful lot of the book is actually about life here and now in a symbolic way so that it applies to God's people throughout the ages. I don't think very much of it is actually signs of the end. Now, there are a couple of passages, which as you, well, I can't see you now, you disappeared again. Um, as you mentioned, um, might refer to what is called the Great Tribulation. That is, is there a, an intensification of, say, persecution right before the end? Some people would say that. I'm not sure. I think you can read passages different ways. And the problem is, if, if you say there is, any moment in history where there is intensification... Well, we can look back to the 17th century and say, well, there was one then. And so they were all going, it's about to happen. And then it died away again. So hi history goes up and down. So I'm not saying there isn't. We've got to be very careful to then go from what's in our newspapers to Jesus' return. Okay, oh, oh, hands everywhere now. And, and the trouble is we're going to have to move on in a second. But one person that put their hand up was my wife. And so I, I need to <laughs> respond. I think we'll just have maybe just two more, I'm afraid, and then we're going to move on. Go on. Perhaps I should ask you this at home. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's more of a wisdom question. So I have a friend who's quite into Israel, and she's a wonderful Christian woman. Yeah. And when I meet her for coffee, she sometimes sort of slips me a newspaper about Israel, and I try not to take it home or 
frankly, it goes in the bin. <laughs> what, my question is, to what extent do you think it's worthwhile trying to, in, like, persuade, argue with people that you might think maybe they've dialed some stuff up too much? Or to what extent do you think it's better just to avoid the topic and try and find common ground? Yeah, thank you. And you're right, it is a wisdom question, and so it's hard to be very precise. I think one, one thing I'd say is it would depend... Well, one thing I'd want to ask... To back up, get my thoughts in order. Uh, it's a secondary issue, OK? It's not a primary salvation issue. So we can agree to disagree, OK? That's important. Having said that, secondary issues can become very important in somebody's life. And so my first question would be, how does it operate in her life? Do I think it's, as it were, becoming unhealthy? Like I could, there could be me and somebody else, and we both believe in the Lord Jesus, and we're both trying to live a life of discipleship, and we're pressing on. They happen to believe this about Israel, I don't. But as it were, it's on the edges of our lives. For somebody else, that becomes so central, it dominates what their discipleship looks like. To the extent that I think this is actually unhealthy for your discipleship, and that would mean I want to say more about it. No, it's not that if it's on the edge, I'd never say anything. I could say, can we have a chat about that sometime? But the more I feel it's affecting and shaping them, the more I'd feel like I might want to engage with it. That's all I'd say. Thank you. I must say, um, I'm very grateful to you for the way in which you stuck closely to scripture in your presentations and sought to understand what scripture is actually saying. What do the words actually mean? Because in this subject, uh, uh, there's so much assumption uh, by people as to what they think the scripture is saying. Yeah. So yeah. that is very good indeed. Inevitably, when we address these issues, we see the things from very much the perspective of our own sweep of history. Uh, but inevitably, God's perspective is different, which brings me to a passage of scripture which I think is the most helpful I ever find in addressing this issue, which is 2 Peter chapter 3. Mm -hmm. Can I uh, ask, are you going to address the <laughs> issues that 2 Peter chapter 3 is talking about in the, the, the second half of your presentation? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, for those kind words and for mentioning 2 Peter 3 because it allows me to say, let's move on um, <laughs> because the answer is yes. <laughs> Sorry, I took a little, a little too much time on that. Let's think about how we're to wait. I'll come back to Mark 13, verse 33. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. That last little section of Mark 13, Jesus takes that idea that you cannot know about that event that's coming, and he takes that simple fact to shape how you now live. You don't know, so be on guard, be alert. He goes on, it's like a man going away. He leaves his house, puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or the cock crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. Um, when I was a teenager, my parents occasionally went away for a weekend or something. And um, uh, if I and my siblings knew exactly when they were coming back, you know, it was 6 p.m. Sunday evening, you know, then we'd happily have people over and they'd be washing up in the sink and the hi-fi would be on loud and we'd be kicking back and, until like, you know, five o'clock and then be like, right, clear up, you know, get ready. But if we didn't know... Well, the house would be in a kind of semi-constant state of readiness, you know. That's a kind of modern equivalent of the picture Jesus gives the master going away. He gives his servants specific jobs to do. They were to get on with their tasks, knowing their master could turn up any time. When he says watch here, he doesn't mean um, try and predict. He's not meaning watch like looking out. 
It's more alert. Stay alert. Ready for return. And the whole point is, it could be any moment. And so you're to remain watchful rather than sleeping on the job. Not knowing is supposed to result in a constant sense of expectation and readiness. So a few thoughts on this. Uh, waiting then is normal in the Christian life. We commented on this briefly yesterday and saw this verse, 1 Thessalonians 9, talking of the Thessalonians' conversion. People talked about how they turned from God to idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven. They are waiting. They are constantly looking ahead. Waiting is normal and we need to think of it as utterly normal rather than occasional moments of thinking, oh yes, Jesus will come, won't he? Now, I don't know what that looks like for you and for your church life, but we commented yesterday, looking back, looking forward, as I think we're better at looking back, in things like our church services. For those of you who lead services, for example, how often does a service express hope for the future? I, I expect they will. We'll sing songs. You know, we... we, 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 uh, we um, Last night we sang, I cast my mind to Calvary and we looked back at the cross and we spoke of Jesus' return. He'll come and, you know, blazing and so on. Our eyes will be transfixed. Lots of songs will do that. I, I hope one of the things that this week will do for us is alert us to that so much more so that, say we're singing that song and we go, yes, I am waiting. Or in our Bible reading. I think it is only two very short letters in the New Testament, like 2 and 3 John or something, I can't remember which ones. Only two that do not mention Jesus' return. Because all of life is to be lived waiting. And as you read, I hope you will be more alerted to it rather than just going, eyes oh, kind of glossing over it. We bought, um, we bought a new car some time ago. It was a Kia, and at the time, Kias were slightly less common than they are now. But you know what happened? As soon as we bought this Kia and was driving it around, I was driving around the streets of Cambridge, and suddenly I looked around and thought, there are loads of Kias. <laughs> Has everyone else bought a Kia at the same time as me? No, of course they hadn't. I was just more alert and noticed them. And I hope one of the effects of this, this session this week will be as we're reading the Bible, we're going to go, oh, there it is. I see it again. Waiting as normal. Uh, waiting patiently. Romans uh, 8, again, we saw it yesterday, but in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? You don't wait for your presence. You don't look forward to your presence on Boxing Day because you've got to them. And the whole point is we don't have it all yet. If we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. And in that passage in Romans 8, Paul is picturing a Christian life that is hoping and looking forward to God's plans, knowing all that he's promised and waiting for it, but doing so patiently. We mustn't be like the servant madly scanning the horizon every five minutes to see if the, the master's coming. We get on with the task. We know it's promised. We know it'll come. 2 Peter 3. God is not slow in keeping his promises, but time works differently for him. A thousand years are like a day, and a day is like a thousand years. So if, if, um, if a thousand years are like a day to God, Jesus is... Uh, resurrection and ascension was, 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 was a couple of days ago. Christians are not to start resigning their jobs, not plan any holidays or whatever, because they're so convinced Jesus is coming next year. And that has been the tendency sometimes, to become a bit kind of manic about it. We don't leave normal life. We wait patiently. But we wait expectantly. 
the verse we started with, 2 Peter 3, in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. We wait patiently, we wait expectantly because it could be any time. Our danger is having said we don't know when he will return, we can easily forget about it and not live with anticipation. And as I said about the rapture ready, rapture index guys, while I disagree, at least they're expectant. Jesus tells another parable one time where he says, uh, the servant of the master is taking a really long time to come. And so they start to live as if they're not coming back. That's our danger, I think. Waiting patiently, but expectantly. I have to tell myself this because of the very normality of life. The sun rises, the sun sets, the seasons come, the seasons go, the years pass. It all just feels, you know, 2 Peter 3, again, people say, the world just carries on going. The world just carries on going. So where is this coming? And the whole point is, it's not that it's going to get, stop working normally, the very normality of life doesn't mean it won't end. It means you can't predict the end. But I have to tell myself that one day the sun will rise and people will get up and they'll have breakfast and they'll brush their teeth and they'll go to work and kids will go to school. And it will be the last day. Jesus will come back that day. That day will come. And it will be a day like any other. We're also waiting for the master. You do not know when the owner will come. The servants are waiting. The whole picture is he's our Lord. He's our master. We're his servants. And what we want is to be doing his will now, knowing he will come back living in a way we'd kind of be happy to if he turned up. The story is told of an eclipse in colonial New England. And when the eclipse happened, the state legislators happened to be in session and they saw this eclipse, they read it as a kind of doomsday sign and some of them panicked and somebody put forward a motion in their meeting uh, that the meeting be immediately adjourned because it might be the end of the world. <laughs> I love the fact they thought they should have a motion, you know, to, to kind of... <laughs> can't just run for it, you know. One of them said, Mr. Speaker, if it is not the end of the world and we adjourn we shall appear to be fools. And if it is the end of the world, I should choose to be found doing my duty. I love that. I want to press on living for Jesus now. That's actually how I wait looking forward. I'm waiting for him. I want to be doing what he'd want to find me doing. Not manic, not frantic purposeful, looking forward, waiting, anticipating. I'm afraid our time has almost gone. Just in war for one minute or so with your neighbour, what are you going to take away from that? Maybe what of those different adjectives, patiently, expectantly, which ones do you want to work with? Or you could um, look at any one of those questions if you like. Just a minute with your neighbour, then I'm going to pray. Let's draw back. Um, I'm sorry to have run out of time, but our time has gone, so we won't have um, more questions, I'm afraid. Um, I'll hang around the front if you want to come and uh, ask me something. Um, just to say, if you are um, interested in more on this, I have written a book on it, and what you've, <laughs> what you've basically got is two chapters of a book. Um, uh, yesterday and today, uh, it's called Last Things First. Um, and, it, it, and it is in the bookstall uh, here if you are interested. I don't mean to be self-promoting. I hope that might actually be 
helpful. Uh, let's pray together, shall we? Uh, Father, please, in your kindness, uh, help us be those who are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth in keeping with your promise, those who are living in hope, those who are waiting patiently, those who are longing, those who pray, come, Lord Jesus. Help us in this, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.